Hello, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Michael Henning. And I am Skylar Hughes. And you're listening to The Bird Herd. Joining us today is the Varsity League of Legends mid laner, a rabbit squirrel 42, better known as Josh. He's here to talk to us today about all things League of Legends. Before we begin, though, we just want to give a quick shout out to some people who helped make this happen, such as Paul Unsby, who's kind enough to help us find us a home to record in. He has been integral to upgrading us from recording Discord calls to a live recording room. So huge thank you to Paul. Okay, Josh, what got you into League of Legends or gaming in general? So I started out with my good old PS2 and Star Wars Battlefront 2 online, which was very, very like rough and rugged online play because you just had to type and you used aim text chats. I was part of Jedi Sith Alliance. We were the best. But I really started getting competitive when I first saw my brother playing League and like, what's that World of Warcraft mod? Loser. It was my first thought. And I started playing and I was hooked immediately. And that was 10 years ago or nine to ten years ago about now. So I've been really competitive. The first tournament I watched was Season 2 World Championship, where I saw TSM lose. It reminded me how good NA is at World Championships for League. Uh, other than that, I just really wanted to get in the competitive scene. I was on my first team, I think, a year later when I was an eighth grader, and I've been playing competitively ever since. So did was that through a school, or was that just like a just team? Just an uh, online group of friends I made online. I think we were called Orbis Gaming. We only lasted, I think maybe two months. We won one to two online tournaments, that was it. So, you play League of Legends and you have for quite a while now. What, uh, are there any other games that you enjoy playing? Um, yeah, I am on my Xbox every time it's it's working. Uh, I usually play Halo with my friends every now and then. We have the old, for, cause for Xbox, you can go back and play just Halo 3 online. We'll do that with the 1,000 people that are still playing it. That's fun. And then I play, like, there's this new escape room game that I've been playing a ton of called We Were Here. That's really fun. So, for those of us who don't know the ins and outs of League and Legends, can you tell us a little bit more about what your role is as the mid laner? Okay, so, basically there's three lanes in League of Legends. Top, mid, bot, and you guess you can count jungle. The mid is the central focus point of the game. Most plays resolve around the mid laner, so it's my job to keep the team set on one focus game plan and remind them of what our objective is at what point in the game from early to mid to late game and slowly i just have to push my advantage over the rest of the map and just help influence our other lanes into winning situations so we can destroy the enemy's nexus when you guys go into picks and bans um as the mid laner it sounds like it's very important how much do you guys focus on drafting mid early or tell me about like the picks and bans and your guys's approach to them okay so picks and bans changes depending on who we're playing against because some teams play heavily top focus some do heavy mid focus and some do heavy bot focus our star carry really is jeremiah hide and squeak he's been performing really well and i usually play supportive and sometimes carry style in mid so we usually pick our mid and or not our our bot lane first just to get a priority for him and then we could pick something supportive for me because i have a big enough champion pool so they can't ban me out in any way so we just play around our bot side and get them strong to win the game. It seems like your uh, versatility in mid definitely helps the overall uh, performance of the team. Uh, how important is it for you guys to have a large god pool so that you can be flexible in a draft? Okay, it's really important because say if you're a one trick, which is a term in league, if you only play one champion, our top laner, David, used to be a Camille one trick, and he had 2,000 games in one season on it. So every team, the first ban was Camille, and it still is their first ban every game. But now he's branched out his pool, I've branched out my pool. So basically, the best thing you want to do is pick five champions, gods, heroes, whatever you want to call them, and just get really proficient at theirs. So there's no way the enemy team can ban you out. They have to focus one person or everyone, which never works out. So having a larger pool makes it really harder for enemies to do pick and ban uh, correctly against your team. So would you say it's more important to have a couple of comfort picks like lined up, or do you try and always play into the meta that's going on right now? Comfort picks are always a strange area when it comes to League, because a lot of people, a lot of teams will stick only to the meta, and some will just go hard comfort picks. Like with Clutch Gaming at Worlds, they were known for their Rumble, Huni, or Rumble, Gangplank, and Kiana, and it was almost banned every single game against them. But they could also play meta picks very well, so it was really hard to do a pick and ban against them. For us, comfort picks are really helpful, so like if David ever gets Camille, we know we're winning topside like 80% of the time. 
And for me, if I get Galio or Syndra, we're usually winning mid lane. So comfort picks are very strong, and it's up to like the enemy team if they want to ban us out and force us onto meta, which we can also play very well. How well do these other teams that you're playing know you, and how well do you guys know the other teams that you're playing? Are there specific teams that you guys play often that you really know the other team's comfort picks, or do you do research and find out stuff like that? Um, right now, we've been having more scrims with NIU, Northern Illinois, and we're slowly adapting to each other's play style. Our last scrim, they won the first game, they will, then we adapted and won the next two, and we're having our second scrim tonight. So soon we'll get to understanding each other's play styles, I assume. Gives us cause some research from OP.GG, which is a website that lets you see people's solo queue rankings, what champions they play, how much they play them, their win rates, and lets them see who they're playing with. It's easier to scout people than ever before. It used to be you have to right-click on their profile, look at their match history, type in each individual summoner's name, and it was a super slow process. But now it's really fast to understand and develop a strategy against other teams. Do you see a meta developing within just you, your team, and NIU's team? And how is that evolving compared to a meta if you hadn't played them already three times? Wow. A meta could develop between the two of us because we both like to play pressure heavy mid laners so eventually we could just ban each other's out to force us onto longer like late game oriented champions instead of early game moving with our jungler and compared to other teams i feel like they pick just the power picks and what picks they have a lot of games on like we played against ball state last weekend and their support was a masters player who played a ton of blitzcrank morgana and we were curious if we could ban those out because we could just have more champions. He's a Masters player, for Pete's sake, so he has an infinite champ pool almost. So you talked about scrimming against NIU and stuff. What other kind of practice routines do you guys have? Um, so on Tuesdays and Wednesdays is our big practice games. We practice 7 to 11 both those nights. Tuesdays we'll play Flex Q, which is ranked fives for League. It just plays against other groups of five people playing ranked together. And then we'll scrim the academy team every now and then, which is our team just below the varsity one that's full of diamond and players as well as ours. Um, and then we'll do VOD reviews, of course, to review certain games. Like our first loss was to RMU Varsity, which we took kind of hard because it was our first real challenge as a team. So we VOD reviewed that, and I think we've really improved after that. I guess explain for some of us who don't necessarily play League of Legends, how do people improve other than playing like ranked and I'll give you an example. For CS, you can practice your aim, you can practice movement, you can watch demos. What other ways other than playing can you improve? Well, the biggest way that I improved is I started watching streamers. Because they, like Scar, especially when I first started out in 2008 or no, no, it had to be around 2009, it was one of the first streamers. He, just, he explained what he was doing, and it was different from everyone else, because everyone else is just playing reaction like it was a Let's Play on YouTube. But he actually like explained his decision-making, why he was going somewhere on the map, and exactly how he could work with his team. And I think that's the first step for League players. Find a really high ELO like player in your position that you really enjoy watching, and who's uh, who explains their movements, and try to mimic it, and then improve it to your own style of gameplay. We've been talking a lot how you prepare for matches and how you practice and such. Uh, tell us a little bit about like what the leagues you're in, like what is this all for? You know, what leagues are you playing in? That kind of thing. We are, the first tournament we were in is GG Leagues, which is a Midwest tournament. They have a live tournament at the end. Or I think it's Thanksgiving break is their finals. It's a cash prize. It's either ten thousand dollars or one thousand. I can't remember it right now, but right now we are four and one in that league, which is much better than last year. We finished four and three, so we're hoping to end six and one to be almost tied or just beneath RMU Varsity. And the other league we are in is C Star Leagues League of Legends Rank One Tournament. Um, that one is like the big college level. CSL does a ton of college things. They do Rocket League, Overwatch, just to think of a couple. But there is a thing, I think we play 12 matches, and if we're in the top four teams, we go into playoffs, and then we can win. In the spring, CSL and Riot, uh, I think, combined to do CLaw, and that's like the scholarship, go to LA and play live one, that we're looking forward to get into. That one's pretty difficult, you have to beat like the top teams in the, in the nation to go there, but we're looking to improve this year and do our best effort. Sounds like you guys have made uh, very large improvements already from last year. Um, can you tell me a little bit about this conference that you guys went to recently? 
Yes, the Educase con uh, conference in Chicago. We left by train early in the morning to get there because we went to get to our hotel and then we had to go set up our computers. There was a bit of an issue because their internet, Dell wasn't getting the internet they were provided for, so it took six hours to get the league set up. And then they turned off the power on them because it was 9 p.m., so it was confusing day one. But then day two, we were on a big main stage just playing League of Legends and showing all of the people interested what a team environment looks like. I think at one point we had 2,000 people watching, maybe. Just five guys playing League of Legends, which seems a little odd to like an outsider. But to us, it was just second nature. And our entire purpose was to show other communities how to, or how an esports group can like foster and develop their own talent and show off how it can help a student. Dell interviewed me and Victor, who's he's a player on the academy team, about how esports has impacted us as students. I think it's going up on Dell's Twitter soon. I'm not sure. But other than that, there was a bunch of different presentations of how to start an esports program, how to find players, and how it can improve school and uh, social life. That's awesome. That's uh, definitely something that we're kind of going through at the moment as well with our expansion in esports. So you practice with the team four hours, two nights a week at least. Uh, you're going to conferences and playing matches with them. Are there any other interesting dynamics to the team or activities you guys do outside of League of Legends? Um, yeah, our support works, works at a Japanese restaurant in town, and we'll tend to visit him every now and then to get sushi or ramen, say hi. Oh, the funny story about that, I ordered sushi one night before one of our matches, and my support came to the door to deliver it. I had no idea he worked there. I was like, <laughs> oh, hi, Jay. <laughs> It was a funny interaction, and then right after that, we beat RMU's second team, so it was a good night overall. But yeah, we'll meet up and hang out. We're planning to get a group of players together to go to get Hot Pot downtown one of these days. Have yeah. there been any like challenges you didn't expect to encounter this year? I mean, it sounds like you guys have had a lot of success, but you know, talk about some of the road bumps. Yeah. Or... The first road bump was really getting through with Jay, who's our support. English is his second language. He doesn't talk that much, so that was the first issue with Jeremiah, who talks a lot in lane. So they had to get through that communication error they had. And then after that, to start off, we weren't all the same rank for flex queue, which is the easiest way to practice. So we all had to individually rank up our accounts separately, which took a lot of time. So our first match against RMU Varsity, which is a team of like three challenger players, hit us hard. We're like, wow. We're not that good, are we? And then we won our next four matches in a row. So like, okay, we are good at this game. And it's just like, slowly we had to realize we're a new team and we just need to build up synergy. And then slowly our synergy has gotten very good. What have you found most difficult to improve? Uh, like, which takes more time? The communication, getting comfortable, or like the individual skill level on the team? I feel like what takes the longest is getting used to a new group of people and just building up synergy, because individual strength, you'll just build up over time playing the game. That's the easiest way, just play solo queue. Our top player plays 14 games a day, daily, so that's where he's getting his strength from. Uh, but yeah, communication was like an issue at first, but communication and synergy is the what makes a good team good. It doesn't matter if you're five challenger players, if you can't talk to each other, you're going to lose to a team of five plats that have perfect synergy. Like... You really need to develop those bonds because they're more than just a name on a screen. They're people sitting next to you, playing your games through you, fighting through the same match and issues that you are. For clarification, how many of you guys are like seniors and stuff? Um, our top laner is a senior. I'm a junior. I believe Jay is a transfer junior, and, uh, and our jungler and AD carrier are both freshmen. Gotcha. So we only have one senior in the varsity team. That sounds like a very strong core for the future going forward. Um, do you have, I know you talked about a streamer already that you really enjoyed, but do you have a favorite player, streamer, or team that, like, newer? Um, I really like Counter Logic Gaming. I've been a big fan of them ever since Double have said everyone else is trash, because I thought that was cool, because no one else was trash talking at that time. He was really the only person to just call out other people, and everyone else would be like, I'm ready for a, a good game, and I hope we can do it. And he's like, that's lame. I want to talk trash. Of course, he always got slapped back, but I still thought it was really funny of how he did it. And then they went on to 3-0 TSM at that, at the, for the first time at their finals, and that's when I became a really big CLG and Doublelift fan. And I've just followed Doublelift from his teams to teams and just support him the whole way. Gotcha. So you talked a lot about, you know, one way that you got better was looking at, you know, a high ELO player. 
Do you kind of take the same mindset with the team as a whole, you know, looking at some of the pro teams out there and trying to apply some of their strategies to the league team? Yeah, there's a couple different strategies you can use in League of Legends. We're trying to adapt to which one works best for us, and we figure that out through the first weeks of playing. There are bot lane usually wins, and when they do, we have a higher chance of winning the game. So we just slowly ad adapted to that style. A lot of teams play it, so I guess you could call us, like, small team liquid for League, they like to play to their bot side a lot, and their mid and top just play the supportive champions to help the bottom lane shine. So, Worlds is going on right now. Um, it's the biggest event of the year for League of Legends, I would say. Um, as a spectator, what has been your favorite moments of it, and what has been your least favorite moments of it? Least favorite right away, NA sucks again. We didn't make it out of groups <laughs> again. Our first seed didn't make it out. C9 got smashed, which is rare. So right now, in my opinion, NA needs to be a more competitive region right now. But other than that, my favorite moments of Worlds was Fnatic actually getting out of that group of death. I com completely counted them out after week one when they lost the clutch twice almost, and it just looked really bad. Knocking out RNG, who are one of the tournament other favorites this year, is just crazy. Because they've been RNG has been predicted to win Worlds and just international for two years, and they've fallen short every single time now, which is really crazy to me. But the last four teams in Worlds is crazy because all of them can win it. And I think that's the first time it's happened in a while. Usually it's like, oh, it's this team, oh, it's this team. But now with SKT and G2 on Sunday, both of them could just win the whole thing. And the other bracket has the former world champions of IG against Fun Plus Phoenix. So you never know who's going to win. Like, It's just crazy this year. All of the matches have been really competitive. I know you, you just said you don't really know who's going to win, but do you have a team that you're kind of rooting for? <sighs> It's hard to say, because as an NA fan, I don't want EU to win, but I also want them to win because they're from the West, and I don't want China or Korea to win because they've won for the past seven years? <laughs> no, six years, I think. But I would really like G2 to win, just because they've been fan favorites. Their Twitter is hilarious. I think they've done the, one of the best esports Twitters. Only second to C9, who have a thing of where they like to tweet on series. They're up 2-0, there's no way they can lose this. And then they get reverse swept and they type, oh my bad, on Twitter. <laughs> it's very entertaining to watch the Twitter updates live during the games. With with Worlds going on, has there been, how has the Worlds meta evolved through the tournament from the play-in stage to now groups and then playoffs? The play-in stage is always odd because you only play four games, so it's like everyone wants to play really safe because if you lose what, two of those games, the fate, it's no longer in your hands. Like, the group that Clutch was in, they had Unicorns of Love and Mammoth Esports. They That was a rock, paper, scissors group is what they call it, because Clutch would lose both games to Unicorns, but then beat Mammoth twice. Mammoth would beat Unicorns twice, but lose to Clutch, and Unicorns would beat Clutch, but lose to Mammoth. So it was just so weird to watch the teams, because everyone wants to play their own style, but they also don't want to lose. So they're picking safe picks. Kale is a pick that surprised me a lot at Worlds. She's always been like this neutral passive laner, but then who scales up really hard into the late game. And she's been super priority picked at Worlds this year. So And she's been like that through play-ins all the way up to knockout stage. Especially for, not, for the quarterfinals, she was pick and ban every single game, I'm pretty sure. So it's really interesting to see how she developed, seeing that she didn't have any huge buffs coming into the Worlds patch. We talked a little bit about your prediction, or who you want to win. Do you have, is your prediction any different from who you want to win, and how are your pickums doing? My pickums are in the bottom of the trash heap that is on fire. I think I have <laughs> 10 total points. I don't think I predicted anything right except SKT beating Splice in quarters. Right now I have SKT going all the way to win it. In my heart I want G2 to win, but in my mind I think SKT is going to take it again this year. They look really strong, they're really dominant. And I think their players are much better than G2's players on paper. So, tying back to, you know, ISU Esports, what do you think that gaming in League of Legends has taught you, and, like, how can it help, you know, students and, you know, players who are, you know, coming in college or even high school? I think Esports is extremely beneficial early on. I think it helped me a lot just talk to people more, because I used to be, like, a decently antisocial. I would just play games in my room. But when I discovered online competitive gaming, I started building up those social skills with other people, realizing it's not just another name. It's just a, it's a real person on the other side of the mic you're talking to, someone you work with. So it helps you build teamwork, leadership skills, team bonding, 
just how to identify a problem and solve it, which is a, a real world like thing. A ton of people in the workplace are looking for people who can identify an issue and then find the steps to solve it. So I think those skills can help anyone, students, high schoolers, college students, just get a job in the workplace after everything is over. But I think esports, all in all, can just really, really benefits the student because it gives them like a new avenue to like find other people who play the same games as them, have the same interests, and also helps them build these real worlding these real world skills that'll help them find a job later in life. For someone just getting into League of Legends, what would you what advice would you give them? Uh, my joke answer is don't play this game. But my real answer is don't be discouraged. There's a lot of people as what we would call it, Smurfs who just make other accounts because they're higher ranks and they're mad they can't get higher, so they build new accounts so they can beat the newer players of the game. But don't, really don't get discouraged. This game has a very, very large learning curve. It took me, I think, four months before I actually understood how to play the game properly. After that point, I started slowly and slowly cr climbing up. And then I hit Diamond and I thought like all my efforts were super worth it when I hit Diamond in my freshman year of high school. Um, but yeah, slowly... Just watch other players and how they succeed and try to mimic it into your own play style. Try to identify, okay, maybe my team is an issue. Maybe I'm the one who needs to change. And slowly look at your own game and watch your mistakes and slowly improve. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for now. Thank you, Josh, for talking to us today. If you're listening to us through YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. Or give us a follow if you're listening on SoundCloud. Either way, make sure you catch next week's episode where we get to talk with players Snail and McMahem on what it's like to play on the Rainbow Six team. One last time, thank you to Paul Unsby for finding us a space to record and making this possible. But most importantly, thank you all for listening. I'm Skyler. And I'm Michael. And this has been The Bird Herd.